Thank you, Ron. That was very kind. It is a great honor for me to be asked to give the Derek Eves lecture. I am um, blown away by the invitation and um, I appreciate it very much. I'm also aware of the fact that many of you in this room are probably not interested necessarily in the content area of competency to stand trial. And so what I have done to try to Thank you, uh, those of you who are polite enough to not care about the content, but to be here anyway this morning, is I have uh, superimposed some photos of my travels. I like to travel. Uh, superimposed some photos of my travel on the background of my slides. Some of you will enjoy this, some of you will find this annoying because you'll have to switch back and forth between your foreground and your background. So if you're interested in the content, try and focus on the words and the foreground of the slides, and if you're not interested in the content, then just list out and look at the photos. And I hope that it's not too distracting. This first photo is a photo of Clearwater Beach near my um, home in Florida. I have known Dr. Derek Eves for 20 years and have been fortunate to have had the opportunity to work with him. I think that Dr. Eves epitomizes uh, what it means to be a forensic mental health professional. He is intelligent, he is kind, he makes decisions in a careful and considerate manner. He is gentle with both his patients as well as other professionals. And perhaps most importantly, to me anyway, uh, he is very research friendly and so for 20 years I've known Derek and Derek and I had the privilege to co-author the fitness interview test with Ron Resch. Of course I would be remiss to be standing up here today and not acknowledge the reason that I am here basically. Um, I have worked with Ron as a graduate student and have known Ron also for 20 years and um, really have been fortunate to have been mentored by Ron and to continue to have a collaborative relationship with him and more importantly to me to have a um, strong friendship with him. Ron and I uh, were lucky enough to be able to author this book, um, Evaluation of Competency to Stand Trial. It's a little book, it's part of the um, Oxford University Press's Best Practices series in Forensic Mental Health Assessment. If you don't know this series, it's an excellent series. It's edited by Tom Grisso, Alan Goldstein and Kirk Halbrin. It consists of 20 books, each about the same size, about 200 pages, in all different areas of forensic mental health assessment. Three different categories. The books are divided into three different categories. I think there's about nine books in uh, criminal domains, and then there's books that deal with forensic mental health assessment in civil domains, and then in family and juvenile domains. And so they're excellent books. Uh, they are written by leading experts in each of the content areas. And perhaps most importantly, they're cheap. They're less than $30. So they're worth looking into if you don't know about this series. Uh, I was asked to write this book at a time when I was starting to shift from more of a research focus on issues of competency to stand trial to issues of professional training. And um, I spent the last number of years kind of traveling around the country training forensic mental health professionals and legal professionals in competency evaluation. And so writing this book really gave me the opportunity to, to step back and to read all of the various literatures in the criminal competency domain, as well as other domains, and to look at all of the legal cases that have been decided with respect to competency to stand trial, and really put all of this information together in what is um, the best practices in competency evaluation. For today's talk, what I would like to do is take this to the next level. I'm not going to reiterate what's in the book. You can read that if you're interested. 
Um, what I am going to do is talk about five areas that I see as um, having a lot of room for improvement for mental health professionals who are working in this particular domain. And although these uh, five areas of improvement are specific to competency to stand trial, I think that some of them are also applicable to other areas of mental health assessment. So I hope if you don't do competency to stand trial work, which I know many of you do not, um, that you'll at least be able to find something useful for the types of assessments that you do in the patient. So, five key areas need for improvement. Uh, we are here at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest freestanding mountain in the world, at 19,340 feet. Um, it's cold at the top, but it's amazing. So, the first area that we need to improve upon is we need to keep evolving standards within our site. Fitness to stand trial, or competency to stand trial, as, as it is known in the United States, fitness to stand trial in Canada, Australia, uh, the United Kingdom, is a doctrine that um, has its roots in English common law. It recognizes the right of the defendant to not only be physically present at trial, but to also be mentally present at trial, and to be involved in his or her defense. It uh, is a doctrine that uh, allows for uh, the fairness and accuracy of the proceedings, as well as protects the dignity and integrity of the criminal proceedings. The standard for competency to stand trial, although it has its roots in English common law and the first case in the United States was in 1899, the actual standard for competency was not set out in the United States until 1960 in the case Dusky versus United States. And in Dusky, the court set out the standard, which um, was that a defendant must have sufficient present ability to consult with counsel with a reasonable degree of rational understanding and a rational as well as factual understanding of the proceedings. In 1961, the case of Whiter versus Settle, the court set out eight functional abilities, um, specific abilities that a defendant was required to be able to perform in order to be considered competent to stand trial. A couple of years later, in 1968, the court decided the case of Wilson versus the United States, and in this case, the court highlighted the functional and contextual nature of competency. This was a case of an amnestic defendant who had no memory for the time of the crime, and so the court was making a decision as to whether or not this rendered him incompetent to stand trial. And they decided that simply having no memory for the events surrounding the time of the offense does not necessarily make one automatically incompetent. And they set out a series of um, functional tests or pieces of a standard that uh, the court would consider in determining whether or not that would render a person incompetent. In 1975, the court really highlighted in Droll versus Missouri the idea of the defendant needing to be able to assist counsel. And so if that wasn't clear from the wording of the Dusky standard, it became very clear from Drope that in addition to having a factual and a rational understanding, that a defendant really needed to be able to consult with and otherwise assist in his or her defense. And this was again affirmed in a 2000 case, United States versus Duhon. Godinez versus Moran was a case that was decided in 1993 by the United States Supreme Court. And uh, Richard Moran was a mentally ill defendant who uh, was charged with murdering three, three individuals. He was found competent to stand trial, promptly waived or dismissed his attorneys, entered a guilty plea, and was uh, sentenced to death. He then, at some period of time later, decided to appeal the decision, his conviction, uh, indicating that he was not competent to plead guilty or waive counsel at the time, and therefore uh, he was you know, appealing the conviction. Uh, the court therefore decided or considered the issue of whether there would be a different, higher standard for pleading guilty or waiving counsel than for standing trial. Justice Thomas wrote the majority opinion in this case, 
and Justice Blackmun gave a, a great dissenting opinion. The, the substance of Justice Blackmun's dissenting opinion, because the court had decided that there was to be one standard for all of these types of competencies. So whether you were standing trial, waiting counsel, or pleading guilty, it was one standard, and it would be the dusky standard that would set out the constitutional minimum for this particular uh, for competency. Uh, Justice Blackman gave a dissenting opinion that uh, really highlighted the contextual nature of competency and the fact that uh, just because one is competent to play the violin, he said, does not necessarily mean that one is competent to play basketball. That competence is very context specific. And we know that this case, this decision to consider the standards the same, um, really set off a lot of controversy in the field. A lot of commentators and legal scholars started writing about this case and talking about not only the contextual nature of competency, but the fact that we really <clears throat> need to consider, you know, specifically what's required of a particular individual in a, at a particular point in time. We really need to acknowledge the fact that there may be different abilities required in different situations and then some debate about whether this means it's a higher standard or just a different standard. There was some fallout from this case as well uh, in terms of other cases where very mentally ill defendants would uh, represent themselves at trial and um, you know, kind of make us a mockery of the system. I'm talking about the Ferguson case for those of you who, who are familiar with that case. The case of an individual who was very mentally ill, had a delusional belief system, and um, basically shot and killed five people and wounded a bunch of others on Long Island Railroad, and then um, waived counsel and represented himself at trial and basically made a mockery of the system. But he was allowed to represent himself because Godinez had set out this same standard. Uh, for competency. Justice Thomas wrote the majority opinion in Godinez, and uh, I'm going to, to quote from Justice Thomas in the majority opinion. He said that, a defendant who stands trial is likely to be presented with choices that entail relinquishment of the same rights that are relinquished by a defendant who pleads guilty. All criminal defendants, not merely those who plead guilty, may be required to make important decisions once criminal proceedings have been initiated. And while the decision to plead guilty is undeniably a profound one, it is no more complicated than the sum total of decisions that a defendant may be called upon to make during the course of a trial. Nor do we think that a defendant who waives his right to assistance of counsel must be more competent than a defendant who does not, since there is no reason to believe that the decision to waive counsel requires an appreciably higher standard of mental functioning than the decision to waive other constitutional rights. <clears throat> so, aside from the main issue in Godinez, which is whether there's a higher standard for pleading guilty or waiving counsel, the majority opinion in Godinez also really appeared to include the defendant's decision-making abilities as being encompassed by Dusky. So if it's not clear from the wording of the standard set out in Dusky, Godinez made it very clear that decision-making abilities were part of the Dusky standard for competency to stand trial. The concurring opinion suggests that the Dusky standard should not be viewed too narrowly, and commentators such as Melton, Petrillo, Poitras, and Sabokin in their seminal text, Psychological Evaluations for the Courts, uh, they have argued that Godin has raised the Dusky standard to include decision-making abilities. Indiana versus Edwards is a case that was decided in 2000, and in this case, uh, Ahmed Edwards was a chronically um, mentally ill individual who stole a pair of shoes from an apartment store, got into a struggle with the security officer who came out after him, and ended up shooting the security officer, wounding him. Uh, Edwards was found not competent, and then competent, not competent, and then competent. And at one point when he was found competent, he told the court, he asked for a um, an extension so that he might prepare his own case, waive, uh, dismiss his counsel and represent himself. And so the Edwards court was then asked to consider whether the state can compel an otherwise competent defendant to uh, proceed with representation at trial, uh, whether they could um, not allow somebody, someone to uh, proceed pro se, or represent him or herself, even though they're found to be competent to stand trial. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
And the court indeed said that the state could compel an, an otherwise competent defendant to proceed with the assistance of counsel and to not allow a defendant otherwise competent to proceed pro se. So Edwards makes it clear that the standard for competence may indeed vary in certain limited circumstances. And then of course the court in Edwards did address the seeming inconsistency with Godinez by saying that Godinez provides no answer here because the defendant's ability to conduct a defense at trial was expressly not an issue in that case. So in Godinez it was waiving the right to assistance of counsel, not proceeding pro se. Splitting the hairs a little bit, but different. And because the case is constitutional holding that a state may permit a gray area defendant to represent himself does not tell a state whether it may deny such a defendant the right to represent himself at trial. <clears throat> Edwards established that competency to proceed pro se indeed requires a higher level of competence than competence to stand trial with the assistance of counsel but remains silent on the issue of how this should be determined or how this should be evaluated. <laughs> Edwards highlights and underscores the contextual nature of competency and the need for a functional evaluation to really take into consideration the specific abilities that will be required of a defendant at trial. So if we take a step back here and we look at the evolution of standard for competency from 1960 when it was first set out in Dusky to the current point in time, what we see is that evolution is a slow process and if we're not paying close attention we may actually miss something because the standards as set out and as adopted by every state in the United States um, has not really changed all that much. The wording is still the same. The wording is either dusky verbatim or very close to dusky. But in fact, when we look at the court decisions of the 60s and 70s, we see that the basic definition of competency centered on whether the accused had this combination of situational awareness and this basic ability to deal with counsel. In the 1990s and the 2000s, with the additional case law that has been added, we see that the court is now more fully describing the ingredients necessary for this interaction between the defendant and lawyer. So it really kind of gives us more information about this otherwise assist prong uh, requirement of the standard. Cooper versus Oklahoma was a 1996 case that also basically highlighted the, uh, the decision-making abilities that are required of a defendant at trial. So the US, support, U.S. Supreme Court cases from the 1990s and the 2000s are an important part of the current definition of competence. And this becomes clear when we look at secondary sources like the American Bar Association National Bench Book. And state courts have acknowledged that controlling case law from the U.S. Supreme Court really must guide the review of inquiries at the trial level. So we see that we're getting a lot of cases that talk about competency and whether, you know, competency per se is the specific issue at, in the case, we see that in the court decisions, they really are starting to delineate more and more of the abilities required of a defendant to be considered competent to stand trial. Phillips Bourne is a legal scholar, but I'm going to talk about a, a, a few of the things that he has said. And in 2004, he wrote an article geared toward legal professionals, lawyers and judges, um, where he warns that sources of standards for competency have not kept up. So state statutes have not really changed all that much, but certainly the interpretation of them has changed as a result of the case law that has been decided. And he says, these statutory definitions exemplify part of the problem. Understanding competence to stand trial requires understanding all currently applicable law and is beyond any one basic local statutory source. So as evaluators, if we're simply looking at what the statute says, the standard is for competency to stand trial, but we're not actually considering what the case law has indicated, uh, the ways in which that standard should be interpreted, we may be missing something very important. So we need to really keep evolving standards within our site and stay on top of case law. <clears throat> the second area where there is room for improvement is that we need to seek out relevant and pertinent information about the proceedings. 
Case law and legal statute have attempted to elaborate on those specific abilities required to be considered competence to stand trial. Some states have articulated standards for competency where they've set out specific abilities that a defendant must be able to perform. <clears throat> the important point here is that competency is an open textured construct. It's not a bright line construct. It's not defined by a fixed set of criteria. It's very much contextual in nature. You very much need to consider the entire context when conducting an evaluation or considering the issue. <clears throat> Excuse me. Golding and Resch in 1988 wrote this comment or this statement, and I think that this has probably been cited in almost everything that has been written on competency to stand trial since that time. Mere presence of severe disturbance is only a threshold issue. It must be further demonstrated that such severe disturbance in this defendant facing these charges in light of existing evidence, anticipating the substantial effort of a particular attorney with a relationship of known characteristics, results in the defendant being unable to rationally assist the attorney or to comprehend the nature of the proceedings and their likely outcome. So very much context specific, depending on this particular defendant facing these particular charges, being represented by this particular defense counsel. <clears throat> the evaluator's role in a competency evaluation is to describe for the court the degree of congruence or incongruence between the defendant's functional abilities, what he or she is able to do, and the abilities required of the defendant at trial to proceed with his or her case. Or, or whatever it may be, if the defendant isn't going to trial, if it's entering a guilty plea, etc. So therefore, competency cannot be assessed independent of the context of the case. As evaluators, we need to find out as much information as possible about what will be expected of this particular defendant facing these particular charges in order to make the evaluation of competency, in order to be able to describe that degree of congruence or incongruence between what he or she can do and what he or she will be expected to do. Phillips Born, when he's talking about the decisions in Godinez and Cooper and the highlight of decision-making abilities and the highlighting uh, the ability of the defendant to participate actively in his or her defense and consult and communicate with counsel, basically set out an entire list of tasks that a defendant might be called upon to make during the course of their proceedings. But Phyllis Bourne also notes that um, if you look at dicta from leading cases, those are going to hold more weight with a judge than secondary sources. So then the articles that we publish or the research that we put out there or the American Bar Association bench book. So if we look at court decisions, we actually can find that there's any number, and I don't know if you can even read these, but there's any number of fairly sophisticated abilities that a defendant might be required to have at trial. Uh, the defendant may need to uh, have decision-making abilities around what is the spectrum of defenses available in a particular case, how the defenses will be presented, whether witnesses will be involved, how the prosecution's cross-examination or rebuttal could influence the guilt or penalty phase of the outcome, etc., etc. A number of fairly sophisticated abilities that, as competency evaluators, if we don't know what it is that we need to be evaluating, we don't know what abilities are going to be required of a defendant, we're not going to be able to evaluate the degree of congruence or incongruence between what the defendant can do and what they're expected to do. And so I think that those of you who evaluate competency, these are fairly sophisticated, complex abilities that would be required that we're not evaluating on a regular basis. Philip Sporn notes that it is both interesting and somewhat alarming to note that some leading secondary sources omit discussion of how a competence examination is to be undertaken if the expert has incomplete knowledge of the breadth of defenses to the charges, possible penalty phase mitigating and aggravating circumstances, or how these might be presented in the case at issue. This kind of practical knowledge would appear to be necessary. <coughs> Phillips Bourne, remember this is an article geared at legal professionals, also indicates that some court decisions suggest it is incumbent upon defense counsel to actually seek out the expert, to provide the expert information about what will be required of the defendant, rather than wait for the expert to contact defense counsel to find out what's going to be required of the defendant. <coughs> 
the case in Duhon versus the United States 2000, uh, in that decision, one of the statements made was, one of the most evident issues is whether the assessing professional, usually a psychiatrist or psychologist, really knows what would go into the defense of a case. And so this highlights the need for the expert and the lawyer to work together to ensure that the expert has a full understanding of the abilities that are going to be required of the defendant so that he or she may actually make that um, evaluation of competency in light of the context of the specific case. Third point, or third area for improvement, is a focus on rational decision making. Rational decision making is the crux of competency of all types, whether we look at various criminal competencies, competency to waive Miranda, competency to plead guilty, stand trial, competency to be executed perhaps, um, medical treatment or treatment refusal, research participation, informed consent, there's a large literature on end-of-life decision-making. One of the states, Oregon, in the United States has physician-assisted suicide. So there's a large medical literature on life and um, end-of-life decision-making. Various capacities for older adults. There are large literatures on testamentary capacity or financial, contractual capacity. And each of these literatures really comes down to rational decision-making as the crux for competency. There's incredible consistency with respect to the abilities implicated in competency. And I think that after my reading of the literatures and writing this book and in staying on top of the field, uh, in the criminal competencies literature, we really lag behind in this area. We don't talk a lot about rational decision making some, but, but really we don't. We focus on understanding and we focus on appreciation, so rational understanding. We don't really talk about rational decision making as a model for competency. And we typically also do not draw from other literatures. We stay in our little area, we read other criminal competency literature, but we really aren't going outside of that and drawing literature from the medical field, from the end of life decision making field, from the older adult, the Alzheimer's research. There's large bodies of research in other areas that are very relevant to competencies and decision making. A broad understanding of these various literatures is the key to being able to conceptualize gray area cases. Those cases that are not clearly competent and not clearly incompetent, but very contextual in nature. It really depends upon the particular defendant in the particular situation facing the particular charges. <clears throat> Rational decision making, therefore, provides a model that we can use for evaluating competency to stand trial. A robust conception of adjudicative competence that gives meaning to the Dusky Standard must ask whether a criminal defendant has capacity to participate meaningfully in that whole host of decisions that are potentially required of the defendant. So a sound assessment of such capacity requires careful attention to both cognitive and emotional influences on rational decision making. A rational decision-making approach provides a model for the conceptualization and assessment of competency, especially in those gray area cases. The component process of the decision-making, the components of the decision-making process in all of these various literatures basically come down to four different abilities. Um, the ability to understand relevant information, including an accurate perception of that information, which is sometimes where symptoms of psychosis may interfere with perception. Um, an assessment of the information and the ability to form appropriate beliefs about it with respect to personal involvement, sometimes called appreciation or rational understanding. The ability to take that information that you understand and apply it to your own personal case. The ability to reason about the information so as to engage in a logical process of weighing options in light of personally relevant goals. And then the ability to express conclusions to others in a coherent and consistent manner. And we know from looking at these other literatures as well as some of the criminal competency literature that cognition or emotion can impact any one of these component processes. 
it's a whole other full day workshop, but really we can go through each of these understanding, appreciation, reasoning, expressing or communicating a choice and know and see that emotion, either depression, mania, other symptoms of mental illness or cognition, thought processes, perceptions, etc., can impact any one of these four different component abilities and interfere with the rational decision making process. We don't tend to think this way a lot in the criminal competencies literature. Uh, the MacArthur Network developed the MACAP, the, the MacArthur Competence Assessment Tool for Criminal Adjudication. And that is a, a forensic assessment instrument, a competency assessor, assessment instrument that actually speaks to these specific abilities and this decision making model. And they drew from the literature on treatment decision making. And so we, they talk about understanding, appreciation, reasoning, and expressing a choice and provide some way to evaluate a defendant's abilities along those four, um, that continuum. But aside from the MacArthur Network and some recent work being done, we're, we're not thinking a lot about rational decision making as a model for competency. And so I think that that is something that uh, we definitely have need for improvement. Dusky standard, um, as I think is clear from the case law that has been discussed, really embraces a requirement of decisional competence. So the defendant must have the ability to make, communicate, and implement minimally rational and self-protective choices within the unique context of his or her criminal case. So a fine-grained analysis of competence then would seek to articulate precisely where in that decision-making process the defendant has gone astray and to explain why those deficits implicate the ability to represent one's own interests within a criminal proceeding. The research on decision-making abilities shows us that they are rarely addressed in evaluation reports. So as evaluators, we're rarely specifically addressing decision-making abilities in the reports, and so if they don't make their way into the reports, I wonder how much we're actually addressing decision-making abilities in the actual evaluation. So research done in 1995 by Lefortune and Nicholson um, of seven functional abilities, it was only the defendant's understanding of the charge that was described in the majority of competency reports. Contextually relevant decisional abilities, such as an appreciation of the plea bargaining process, were rarely addressed in these reports. Jennifer Scheme and her colleagues in 1998 did some work where they were looking at the content of competency evaluation reports, and they also found that certain abilities that were important and relevant to competency, such as decision-making abilities, were rarely addressed by evaluators in their reports. So this all score under, underscores the need to attend to evolving standards and then make sure that we're addressing those standards within our competency evaluations and then to make sure that that actually makes its way into our competency evaluation reports. Next area for improvement is to delineate all linkages or to substantiate our conclusions. As we know, the key elements in competency evaluation include that the defendant have a mental illness or a defect. That's simply a threshold issue that must be in play. Um, in addition to a mental disease or defect, they must have some functional deficit, some deficit in functioning, some ability that they are not able to perform. The causal connection must be made between the deficit that the defendant is showing and the mental illness or defect. Simply having those two co-occur is not enough. There must be a causal connection between the deficit and the mental illness or defect. And so in our reports, we need to describe that causal connection, we also need to establish the linkage between the functional deficits and the functioning at trial. So the, the functional deficits, the, the, the functioning of the individual, and what he or she will be expected to perform at trial. Our role, remember, is to describe the degree of congruence or incongruence between functional abilities and required abilities at trial. The cause of any deficits will often dictate appropriate prescriptive remediation. 
So in our evaluation reports, we can talk about ways to help the defendant improve his or her functioning, ways that we might be able to improve the defendant's functioning through prescriptive remediation. Maybe it's working with the defendant in a particular way or using a particular type of language with the defendant. It might be the need for treatment, but there are ways that we can work with defendants to help increase their level of competency. And while most evaluators agree that it is important and necessary to include this causal connection in our evaluation reports, few of them actually do this in practice. When we look at the research findings, we see that 90% of respondents, so Borman Brissot in 1996 surveyed forensic diplomates in uh, psychiatry and psychology, asking them about various practices with respect to competency evaluation and insanity evaluation. 90% of the respondents agreed that including a delineation of the link between mental illness and deficits was either essential or recommended. But when we look at competency evaluation reports, we see that Although 90% agree, very few actually do this in the competency report. Um, Robbins and colleagues in 1997 reported that 27% of the reports that they looked at provided this explanation between how the defendant's mental illness influenced his or her deficits. And then Jennifer Skeen and her colleagues in 1998 found that in their sample, only 10% of evaluation reports provided this causal connection between the mental illness and the the deficits that the defendant was showing. In terms of linkages, I use this word to refer to um, describing how a defendant's functional deficits will impact what is required of him or her at trial. We're also not very good at delineating those linkages for the courts in our evaluation reports. Uh, we need to clearly describe the group congruence or incongruence between functional abilities and required abilities, um, which might mean that we need to go beyond articulated standards as evaluators. Competency is an open, textured construct. It's very much dependent upon the specific context of the case. And so the specific context of the case for a particular defendant may include more than what is delineated in the state statute. Context matters and it will dictate the abilities that are required for the defendant and is our role to evaluate current functioning with functioning required at trial. Similarly, when we look at the research findings with respect to delineating the linkage between functional deficit and deficit inabilities at trial, we see that we are also poor at doing this. 12% of the reports in schemes sample uh, delineated the congruence between defendants' abilities and the case context. And in Robin's sample, this was not done. Zero percent of the reports delineated this degree of congruence between functional abilities and required abilities. We know that the purpose of the competency evaluation report is to substantiate, to, to lay out for the court our opinion, but also to substantiate our conclusions and our opinions. We need to describe the data, the sources of data, and, and our inferences about the data clearly for the court so that they can use that in making the legal decision. We need to delineate the logic and rationale behind any of our conclusions or opinions. Our role is not to make a determination regarding competency. Even if we provide an ultimate opinion about competency, it's simply an opinion the legal decision is left to the court to make. Our task is simply to describe as clearly and accurately as possible that which the defendant knows, understands, believes, or can do. We need to delineate everything and then simply leave it to the court to make the decision, even when we provide an ultimate opinion. And finally, we need to communicate prescriptive remediation strategies for increasing meaningful participation. We know that the courts rely very heavily on evaluators' reports. When we look at the research in this area, when we compare decisions by an evaluator as laid out in his or her competency evaluation report and decisions made by the court with respect to a defendant's competency, we see staggeringly that the courts are basically taking the decision of evaluator and using that. 
1986, Ranking 2, he looked at some competency evaluation reports and they found more than 90% agreement is how it was described in the research study. It wasn't the focus of their research, but more than 90% agreement between the evaluator's opinion and the court decision. Hart and Hare in 1992 found a 95% agreement between evaluator opinion and court decision. In some research that I did with some of my students at the University of Alabama, we looked at 406 evaluation reports and compared them to the uh, ultimate decision determination by the court. In one of the 406, was there a disagreement between the evaluator and the ultimate decision made by the court? 99.6% of the time, the court was simply going with what the evaluator described, what the opinion of the evaluator was in the report. Just in terms of some anecdotal evidence, you know, I would go around and I talk to different groups, friends of mental health professionals and legal professionals about competency, the standards, how to be evaluated, what to look for in a good evaluation report, you know, taking our practice to the next level in this area. And when I talk to legal professional groups, I often get this, you know, just ability to blindly adhere to the evaluator's opinion. When I, you know, in Alabama, I was giving a workshop and one of the judges that I testified in front of a number of times, Judge England, he said, you know, Dr. Zaff, you just tell me whether the person's competent or incompetent. You know better than I. I don't have the background. I don't have the knowledge in this area. I just want you to tell me whether the person's competent or incompetent. So legal professionals are really relying on us to help them make their determinations. And I think that this means it is really important for us to make sure that we are doing a good job in our competency evaluations that we are accurately and adequately assessing what is required of a defendant, and that we are laying out the bases for our opinions in the evaluation report so that those professionals, legal professionals, can actually understand the reasoning and the rationale behind our decisions. When we look at research, um, and common report deficiencies, we see that all of these areas are deficiencies in our evaluation reports. A lot of times we lack substantiation of conclusions. We're not great about detailing the linkages between the mental illness and the psycholegal abilities required, and then the functional abilities and the particular abilities at trial. We don't substantiate our conclusions. We're not great about writing the specific bases for our opinion. We rarely address that causal connection between mental illness and deficits. We almost never address the degree of congruence between functional abilities and the abilities that are required to proceed. And we rarely address decision-making abilities, even though it is clearly part of the standard for competency to stand trial. And then in terms of prescriptive remediation, we also don't do this very well. For mental health professionals, we have some ideas about how we might be able to improve the functioning of a defendant with mental illness, but we don't go there in our evaluation reports, even when it's statutorily required. So again, in Alabama, some students and I were doing this research on these 406 evaluation reports, and in Alabama, they have statute that, like many states, when the opinion is that a defendant is incompetent to stand trial, the evaluator must then delineate a number of other uh, pieces of information. What's the reason for the incompetence? Uh, what's the likelihood it can be treated? Where should it be treated? How long will it take to be treated? Even when that information is statutorily required to be included in the evaluation report, it's often not. And so many statutes don't require us to provide prescriptive remediation when it's a, you know, a marginal case. Very often it comes down to a conditional. If this is the situation, then the defendant may actually not have this particular ability. If that is the situation, they may be able to perform what is necessary at trial. So it's okay for us to take it a step beyond and to include prescriptive remediation in our reports, but we often don't. To summarize, we have room for improvement in this field. Uh, we have five key areas where we're lacking right now and we really need to 
to take our practice to the next level. We need to keep the evolving standards within sight. We need to seek out pertinent and relevant information about the proceedings so that we can accurately and adequately describe the degree of congruence between the functional abilities and the abilities that are required at trial. We need to focus more on rational decision making, and I think we probably need to conduct more research and commentary in this particular area in the criminal competency domain and pull in from other literatures. We need to delineate all the linkages and substantiate our conclusions in the reports so that legal professionals for whom we are writing these reports to assist in making the legal determination actually can find our reports useful and helpful and understand the bases for the conclusions and the opinions that we come to. And we need to communicate prescriptive remediation strategies, ways that a defendant might be able to increase his or her functioning may be as simple as communicating in short and simple sentences to a defendant who has a difficult time understanding. <laughs> and we leave off where we started at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. I thank you for your time and attention and again for the honor of giving this lecture this morning. Thank you.